plasmonic spark and metasurfaces. And the first speaker is uh, Magnus Jonsson. He's uh, an invited speaker, and he will talk about uh, plasmons in uh, polymers. I, when, I, when I saw the, the, the paper that he published, I immediately contacted him because I found it quite fascinating that uh, there are polymeric plasmonic resonat resonators. And uh, so I thought this would be a really good match for this, um, for this conference. And uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to your talk. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, so let's see if it will be interesting or not. Uh, I hope so. So I, I will focus uh, a bit on other, other things too, but at the end, uh, go into those uh, polymer plasmons, which was something that we in my group wanted to do for many years and finally it started to work. So I'm uh, happy also to start up uh, collaborating with Ryan now on, on, uh, on this further. So uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, for a possibility to join this uh, workshop. It's a uh, it's been very interesting so far. I uh, next to no knowledge about EPR at all, so it's, it's nice to learn new things and uh, also uh, some things that are, let's say, more related to what we're doing in my team. So I lead a group at Linköping University, and uh, this is our campus area. It's uh, very beautiful. I hope you can get the chance to visit after the pandemic. And uh, by the way, I really looked forward to coming and visit you for, for this workshop, but uh, I'm sure there will be more opportunities in the future. So this is my small team over here. We call Organic Photonics and Nano Optics Group. And uh, we are interested in, in a few different things in my team, uh, but it can be largely divided into, let's say two different themes, uh, where one is uh, hybrid plasmonics, where we combine more conventional plasmonic surfaces made of uh, normal metals like gold or silver or aluminum with organic materials of various sorts. Uh, actually, uh, enjoy, enjoyed the strong coupling talk before. So we have some interest in strong coupling also. Uh, we are starting to explore this a bit and uh, we were not least fascinated by some uh, preliminary reports showing that you can even affect things like charge transport uh, using strong coupling. Uh, we recently published a paper on that where we, however, did not see any effects. Uh, so this is a bit of a controversy in, the, in, the, in this community at the moment, I would say. Otherwise, we work quite a lot with uh, applications. So we have a large uh, part focusing on displays and uh, creating colors in, in various ways. And also we work quite a lot on energy conversion and sensors. The other part of, of the team is focusing on uh, studying optical effects purely in organic materials that uh, Reiner was also alluding to. So we, for example, trying to, to get plasmonic behavior in polymers. And we're also looking into polymeric photonic crystals and uh, also very interested in um, thermal emission. So th this is also, um, so, sorry that most of the talk will be about visible properties, but we're also interested in, in things in the infrared uh, around 10 micrometer where you have thermal emission at room temperature and to use, use this for, uh, for cooling of objects without input of external energy. So radiative cooling. All right. So Today, I was, uh, wanted to get some type of uh, common thread throughout the talk. So I thought I'd start a bit with our hybrid plasmonic displays and then move over to talk about structural coloration using uh, this type of uh, same type of polymers and then go to what happens when we, when we make nanostructures of these same type of materials. So all of these different three parts will have in common that we work with different types of these polymer called P dot, which is a polymer that can conduct electricity. And I will come back to in, in different parts of the talk on uh, what type of properties these have and how they work. So first part, hybrid plasmonic displays. First of all, maybe you wonder why even develop new displays. We have very good displays already and uh, also light sources for that matter. Uh, there has been a really enormous uh, evolution of displays and light sources recently in the in the in the visible and they have they have really good efficiency but even with 
even if they would have 100% efficiency in terms of converting electrical energy to, to, to light, they, they are still producing light. So they emit light and their energy consumption is large. And the global use of this place also is uh, increasing and will uh, continue to do so with the continued development of the world. So we believe that uh, there is a need for complementary types of displays that do not produce the light themselves, but instead take advantage of light uh, in the surrounding. So uh, light from the sun, light from, let's say, other light sources in, in a room, etc. So these are called reflective displays. So you work, work with ref controlling the reflected properties of a surface to produce images. So this is very much uh, similar to uh, just a normal piece of paper, but instead it's an electronic paper where you can control and change pictures or text. And with that, we hope to achieve a large power savings by not emitting light and also by using materials by which you have a by stability that you can, you set the, the image or the text that you want to see, and then you only need energy when you change it. So not by keeping it, uh, which, is, which is a challenge though. Other benefits of this type of reflective displays is that uh, I think, think you all have tried to, to work on, on laptops outdoors and in, in the sun, that is not very easy. Uh, these type of displays actually get better uh, by having strong surrounding light instead. <clears throat> this is not new. So uh, electronic papers ha have been around for a while. There are nice commercial uh, alternatives like the electrophoretic ones from the, like the Kindle devices that are most famous probably. There are also some other types and uh, they have a few limitations uh, that are uh, common for them. And that is that they have quite low reflectivity. And, and that is really important because uh, with a normal display, you can just crank up the power and get more light out. Uh, but here, you don't have more than the light in the surrounding. So you have to really work with high reflective surfaces. It's not enough that the colors are of high quality, but the brightness needs to be really high also. This is tricky, and that also makes them mostly used for, for black and white applications. So that's why we don't have any uh, good alternatives of uh, electronic papering in color today although many people are trying. So our approach to this has been a little bit going back to the roots of plasmonics. And in my, in my knowledge, the first application of plasmonics, and that is to use metallic nanoparticles for coloration. So metal nanoparticles have the plasmonic resonances that depend on shape and size and what type of metal they have. And by controlling that, we get resonant scattering and absorption of light uh, as illustrated in this graph here, which creates really beautiful colors. So this is an example. Uh, it's, it's from Spain, actually. So it's a picture I took many, many years ago at the conference in, in the Casa Matier in uh, Barcelona. Sorry if my pronunciation is not correct here. Anyway, so, so this, this has been used for very, very long since the medieval times to, sorry, should move back one slide, for coloration, plasmonics. But nowadays it has been a renewed interest, uh, not least because we have much better control of the type of structures that we can make. So I think this, this is a nice example showing what type of resolution that is possible to make. This is world record uh, uh, resolution of uh, pr color prints. At least it was at, at the, when it came out, which is re really cool. So this is plasmonics uh, that creates all these, all these colors uh, with a resolution that is uh, very, very, very high. It's also possible to, to make bendable surfaces very easily. And uh, you can have high quality of the colors, which is how green does it look, how blue does it look. So that means uh, that the colors are good. And also with a large color gamut that is possible to create a lot of different types of colors. And at the same time, maintain very high reflectivity. So, so that is uh, really crucial for these type of devices. So, most people maybe when they when they think about plasmonics is uh, how light interacts with the metallic particles uh, but it's also possible to make the inverse 
type of structure where you instead have a thin metal film and make a lot of nano holes in, in it. Uh, these can also have similar plasmonic uh, properties, uh, mostly based on plasmons that propagate between holes. So the physics is a bit different, but the effects are very similar. So it's possible to get nice colors when you look at light shining through plasmonic nano holes. And we have explored quite a lot uh, previously unique possibilities with these type of plasmonic nanoholes compared to having discrete nanostructure like a particle or a nanorod. For example, you can use them as an electrode at the same time. So we use them to, to uh, uh, as plasmonic electrodes, let's say, in also converting light to heat and then also to electricity using thermoelectric effects. And you can also make them puncture them all the way through the substrate. So you make very thin membrane and uh, make holes all the way through. And then you can flow liquids through and use them as a uh, flow through biosensors, which has uh, improved uptake of a material and therefore also improved detection limits. So, but in this project and, and in this talk, I wanted to focus on instead how to make colors uh, using these nano holes. And then we, combine the nanoholes with a cavity here. So this is essentially a simple Fabry-Perot cavity where the plasmonic nanohole surface is the semi-transparent semi metal that we have uh, as, the, as the top layer. Then it's possible to control uh, the color by mostly changing the thickness of the spacer layer instead of changing the holes so much. Although the red one, actually, we don't have any holes because we get even better colors uh, by having only the fabric pro effect in this case. And with the possibility to have essentially the same type of holes on top, it also opens up for uh, quite good fabrication uh, possibilities. So I showed you before the possibility to have very high resolution to make plasmonic uh, color images. But uh, if you want to make large scale structures instead, it's not very convenient to, to use electron beam lithography to draw one structure at a time. So instead we focus uh, quite a lot on self-assembled nanofabrication where we can make really centimeter large areas using self-assembly of beads that we use as templates to make these type of nano holes. So that makes it possible to do really large uh, type of uh, samples. So this one looks white because it contains uh, lines of all different colors. So it's possible to combine and then get essentially any color. And you can then do this in a, in a pixel format to uh, reproduce uh, real photographs in color. So this is a plasmonic meta surface that produce uh, colors and have a color image. And the, uh, the uh, scale bar here is one centimeter. So this is, this is pretty large and quite easy to, to make. All right, but these are static and that is uh, one of the main challenges in plasmonics also is that the most plasmonic systems are static. And uh, I will show you first now one example where we try to make some type of tunability to these systems. And then towards the end, I will also uh, show a, a different way to make plasmonics dynamic. All right, and that uh, brings me to the common thread in this talk, which is this uh, type of polymer that Rainier uh, mentioned in the beginning also. So these are, this is a type of conducting polymer. So uh, we are used to plastics, uh, organic plastics being uh, insulators, but instead these type of polymers can actually conduct electricity. And they have charge carriers along the backbone here, and we can tune this uh, charge carrier density using electrochemical means. And it means also that we affect the optical properties of the system. So in the graph shown here shows how the, the material uh, absorb light when it's in its oxidized form. Uh, and and uh, see in the visible here that it's relatively transparent in this state. But then if you change the redox state of the polymer, it becomes reduced instead. and uh, then you have a peak in the visible and it gets really blue. Let me see if I can add a laser pointer here, it doesn't disappear all the time. Okay, I hope this works well. All right, uh, and that means that we can back and forth like this, 
change the redox state of, of, of two different films of this material and change how it looks basically. And this is a, then a simple type of so-called electrochromic display. This is a photograph of such a system. And these two areas here, the blue one and the more transparent, it is the same material, but we have changed the redox state of the material. So it can be transparent or more opaque, and uh, but it has a large uh, limitation here, and that is that it doesn't really change color. So it, it's only blue or not blue, let's say. And also the reflectivity is really, really low. And that uh, is the reason why we then make a hybrid type of system here, where we combine now these type of polymers, have them on top of these highly reflective plasmonic surfaces, and then they can be used basically as a shutter to, to turn, turn on and off the plasmonic colors in a quite nice way, although the, it can be further improved here, the results, I believe. All right, so we believe that this could be quite useful for, for a new generation of electronic paper in color uh, for a few reasons here. But in the next generation of the debt uh, that I will not really talk to uh, you about today, but I just wanted to give a little teaser here that uh, we're working now also on having functional layers within the cavity of this, uh, of this system instead to not only turn these colors on and off, but also change the colors. And it works quite well, actually. So uh, sorry that the video is jumping up and down a bit, but this is quite preliminary results. You, you see this type of pixels that, that change their color now also, not only turning them on off, yeah. So maybe another time we'll get time to talk about that. Now I would like to move to part two though. Let's check the time a bit. All right, and that is, um, I talked about uh, these type of polymers that they can change between being blue and being uh, transparent. And that is a big limitation. And we, we saw that as a challenge in the team and wondered, could we make them colored using interference effects? And it turns out to be uh, possible to do that simply by making thin films, controlling very accurately the thickness and putting them on a metallic mirror. So uh, very simple. Um, a little bit surprised that it was not done before. But so we basically control the thickness of these thin films and uh, increase the thickness. And then we can tune the color so that this conventionally blue P dot material now can uh, obtain any different color, basically. And why are we interested in this? Well, partly because we know that we can control the thickness of the polymer very accurately using a UV exposure step during the deposition process. So during the deposition process, if we have an exposure step of, of different times here, we can control the thickness uh, from let's say 180 nanometers up to over 300 nanometers. And this can also be further controlled by varying other parameters. But here, all other parameters are set the same. And that means that it should be possible to, uh, these, these are simulated predictions, should be possible to control the color simply by having this UV exposure during uh, the position. But moreover, it's not only the thickness that change, but we also found in this study that UV exposure also affects the optical properties of the polymer, the material properties. So the real refractive index goes up quite significantly actually, and the imaginary component of the refractive index goes down. And that means that when we in, in the experiments and also in the simulations here, uh, do this UV treatment, we, we change both the thickness and also the permittivity, which means that we actually move across this diagonal here when we, when we do the UV, UV treatment. And why is this interesting? Well, I, I find it, let's say, uh, fundamentally interesting too, but it has, actually has uh, some positive side effects. So when we, increase the thickness of these systems. We redshift the resonances as for a normal cavity, but at the same time, the imaginary component of the refractive index goes down in the red part of the spectrum, which means that we can get high reflectance back uh, by doing, doing the UV exposure. So it actually improves the color uh, in, in an additional way here. And at the same time, the real part of the refractive index 
goes up, which also redshifts the resonance. So we have two different effects that redshift the resonance at the same time. And that means that we can create red resonances at lower thicknesses and thereby further get less absorption and higher reflectance. And there are a few other effects too that I don't want to go into now because I want to move to this, which I think is, is the, it's the cool part about this, this project. So if we now have a process where it's possible to control the color by UV exposure, we don't have to necessarily change the time that we do exposure, but we can control instead the dose using a photo mask, just like in normal photolithography, and then create colored surfaces by simply exposing the sample through a mask one-time exposure and automatically get all different colors at the same time. So that makes it possible to make color images now uh, with uh, one single step exposure with a quite high resolution and uh, getting different types of colors also by changing other parameters in this case. Okay, so what does these uh, colors actually come from? So it turns out that it's it's not really a normal Fabry-Perot cavity effect because the reflection at the top interface is really low and it doesn't contribute much to, to this uh, type of effect. But instead, we believe that the color arises from interference effects, constructive and destructive interference occurring between incident light and light reflected only at the bottom surface. So it forms a standing wave, and then we get constructive and destructive interference and different amount of absorption at different wavelengths, depending on the thickness still of the, of the polymer. And this is important because that means that it should be possible now to further reduce the reflection of the top interface uh, and still get colors. And that is important because if we want to now tune the redox state of this polymer electrochemically, we need to immerse it in an electrolyte in water. And then we reduce the refractive index contrast at that top interface. And uh, that, so that is possible. We can immerse them in electrolytes and now start to tune these images back and forth. And uh, this is not done on a pixel based, uh, pix not on, a, on, on different pixels at the moment, but we do it simultaneously for, for the whole image, let's say. And uh, the, videos are not, not fantastic, but I hope that the resolution is, is uh, good enough to see something here. So I, it's a picture of me starting to appear here in the middle, uh, which then comes from that, that the polymer is starting to oxidize, so you get strong colors. And then the colors also will start to, let's say, change back and forth. All right, let's see how much time I have left. Not much. So I will uh, continue to, to the last part. And that is what happens now if we don't only shrink the dimensions at the nanoscale uh, as for a film, but also in all dimensions to make nanostructures of these type of materials. I mentioned before that these don't behave like conventional polymers, but they can conduct electricity. This was awarded with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2000. And the type of polymers that we use looks like this. And they have so-called polaronic charge carriers, uh, positive charge carriers along the backbone, which can be tuned. And the question now is, are these charge carriers, do they make the polymer sufficiently conducting so it can behave as, as a metal, also optically? And in order to try to investigate that, we spend quite a few years actually on how to determine the optical properties of these materials in a very large frequency range. And uh, so it goes from the, from the UV and all the way to the terahertz range. So this, at least I have a, one reference to, to terahertz here. Uh, and and, and uh, based on this, it's it was possible for us to, to evaluate different types of models, how to describe the optical properties of these materials. And we came up with the, with the model where we have a Drude component that describes the, let's say, free charge carriers in the material, and then Lorentz oscillators to account partly for localization of these charge carriers, but primarily to vibrations, uh, molecular vibrations in the material, which affect the optical properties also. So using this methodology, uh, we, we could screen different polymers and optimize them. And we could find some that had a very high conductivity, which provided them with plasmonic properties. 
So it has a negative permittivity in, in a large range here, starting from the visible or, or the end of the visible and relatively low uh, losses also, the imaginary component of the permittivity. Simulations then predicted that uh, they should uh, indeed be able to provide localized surface plasmons if we make nanostructures of this, so nanodisks here in this case. And uh, we could experimentally verify that also using a very similar fabrication technology, as I mentioned before, for the holes. And we get dipolar-like resonances here that we are now also trying to observe together with uh, Reiner's uh, nanoscopy techniques. So we can tune these resonances by, by size, and we did this partly to try to understand how do they work. And it turns out that they work very similar to what you would expect for a conventional metallic nanodisc, just in a little bit different wavelength range. So these are in the infrared now. And also calculations based on uh, dipolar uh, resonances in, in oblate spheroids uh, match the results really well here. Uh, all right. I'll finish in, in one minute here. So one of the exciting things then with these materials is that they, they don't really have fixed material properties, but we can tune them as we used previously for display applications also. And this is exemplified here. We have a thin film of this material also, and it has strong absorption in the infrared due to the free charge carriers. But if we reduce it, this goes down because we lose the charge carriers. It's no longer a metal. It's no longer a metal. And that is an interesting, if we make nanostructures of this, we have a plasmonic material that we can turn into dielectric material. And doing so, we show that we can have these type of plasmonic resonances and we can turn them on and off. And it, this is, I think, one of the very interesting uh, future directions for this type of work also. Uh, so we, we try to, uh, we, we control these resonances now and, and the tuning using chemical means. And we are now working also on controlling them electrically to have really optical nano antennas that can be tuned uh, in situ. Not tuned the whole, only the far field, but also, also the near fields of these uh, systems. All right, so a quick summary. These type of polymers can be very useful uh, in combination with normal plasmonic systems. If you make them into thin films, it's possible to get structural interference colors. And if you make them into nanoscale structures, they can also sustain plasmons. So this was done with, with, the, with the help of, of a lot of people here. So I would primarily like to thank Shangxi for, for the work on, uh, on the plasmonic antennas I showed in the end, and also on the interference colors and uh, Stefano Rossi, who worked a lot on the displays. And uh, of course, our collaborators, uh, not least uh, Professor Vanya Darakshiva, uh, who is responsible for the terahertz materials analysis center here at Linköping University, where we do the terahertz uh, ellipsometry of these materials. And uh, yeah, I can mention also Shangxi is, is, is a great uh, doctor student, and he will graduate on Monday. So if you're interested in being part of the uh, seeing the defense uh, we have a zoom link for this also okay i think i stopped there and i hope i didn't use too much of the time oh, thank you very much magnus for this <clears throat> very nice overview um so now we have uh, time for questions uh, so if there are any questions then uh, raise your hand or just uh, let me know uh yeah, so I asked on the chat. Sorry, my, my webcam is not working right now. Okay, I, I see. I can try, but I think it's... Uh, yeah, please go ahead. No, anyway. Um, yeah, I was I was asking, uh, I mean, first, it's a, it's a very nice and interesting approach. Thanks for, for the presentation. And uh, I was wondering what is the thinnest possible, uh, I mean, what is the thinnest possible thickness you can uh, prepare with such polymers like P dot or related polymers? So you showed about 180 nanometer. Mm. Could we go much thinner, like few nanometers, or what, what, what do you think is possible? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So uh, I didn't go into details on how we produce these, and I hope to get the chance to talk about that some other time. But we use primarily a method called vapor phase polymerization, where you start with an oxidant layer that you spin coat on the substrate, and then you polymerize the film directly on the substrate. And we control that um, 
in a few different ways, but uh, in, in principle, for the materials I showed here, it starts from maybe 100 nanometer and then up to a few hundred nanometers. But it depends on also the counter ions and the oxidant that you use. So for the materials that I showed at the end with the nano disks and the antennas, they are thinner, so they are around 30 nanometers, and we can go down to uh, at least 10 nanometers. Okay. We haven't really looked into how thin we can make them and still have them uh, survive the next part of the process, let's say. Uh, but uh, I think we can go down to a few nanometers, probably. There, there are other ways to make even thinner ones also. Oh, very interesting. OK, thanks. There are more questions. Jakob, I see. Uh, hi, so thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I'm not really from this field, but I wanted to ask. Uh, so I get that if you change the thickness of this polymer, then you get a different color, right? Mm. So then if you would have this screen, like ultimately, uh, then it would have to really change. You will have some like actuators to, to change the thickness, to change the color, or how would it work regarding yeah. these pixels or? Yeah, good questions. Idea? It's a good question. So I would say that the intention with, with that project was perhaps not to make pixels in the end, but rather to make labels, like electronic labels uh, that are now used um, in packaging, for example, to make arrows or something like that, but to make them in color. So they will always have the same color uh, in that case. But uh, we, we also find that uh, some of these materials actually change thickness uh, when you change the redox state. And that is, that is uh, we haven't published that yet, but uh, they can actually significantly change their thickness, which makes, means that we could also then tune the color using the polymer itself. Okay, that would be interesting. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I see Philip has a question. Okay, hello. Uh, I can imagine that uh, these Fabry-Perot uh, filters are uh, very sensitive to angle of incidence. So how is it with the angle of incidence of these uh, color images and everything? Yeah, yeah, good point. So they, they have some uh, angle of incidence uh, uh, sensitivity. It's a little bit less than a conventional Fabry-Perot cavity because you have the plasmonic nanoholes that have a less uh, sensitivity to, to that. And the reason for that is that it's not a periodic system actually, but it's more this random order that we, that we use. But sure, uh, completely removing angle sensitivity uh, would be very interesting. Uh, we have some ideas how to use do that by combining the fabry perot effect with, uh, let's say, meta surfaces that have the opposite angle dependence, but we haven't done that yet. Yeah, thank you. Nice work. Thank you. Okay, I don't see more questions. I have uh, a question. So uh, could you comment eventually on um, uh, the quality factors and in comparison to metals, let's say gold or or semiconductors uh, in the near infrared, because I see that your resonances are located more in the near infrared range. And I'm wondering um, what prevents you to go eventually to, uh, to, to, to um, a longer wavelengths even. I mean, so maybe mm -hmm. all along this direction. Yeah, would be interesting yeah, 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 but this is, uh... It's a, it's a tough question. So uh, uh, they, they have quite large losses. Uh, and that mm -hmm. is uh, something I think it will not be probably best for applications where you really need the lowest losses and, uh, in, in that sense. But they are, they are OK, let's say. So the quality factor is, is it's much worse than gold if you would just uh, increase the size of the gold and make, uh, make the resonance at the same, same wavelength. So I think we would instead have to take advantage of, let's say, possibilities that you don't have with the, with the other materials, like the tunability. So uh, yeah, so losses are quite, quite high. If you, you ask you to move them further into the infrared, uh, we, we have done that, uh, at least in the computer, let's say, on simulations using the, the optical properties of the, of the material. And uh, it, it works. We can get quite OK resonances. But the, let's say, the negative permittivity increases more slowly than the imaginary and the mm -hmm. part and the losses increases. So we are less good for plasmonics, I would say, but it still works. Mm -hmm. And how far you can go into the visible with your plasmonic resonances? These, it? The, it depends um, very much on, uh, on the exact film that we make, but we, we typically manage to get the sign change of, of, of the permittivity around uh, 
let's say five, 600 nanometers, so within the visible, but we, it's not easy to cover the whole visible. Mm, that's, so, that's, an, that's a quite, quite high uh, carrier concentration uh, that, that you achieved there. So uh, that, yep. that's, that's uh, how, 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 how is this done actually? Because I, I'm not sure whether I've ever seen such high carrier concentrations in, 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 in a polymer. Yeah, so, so the, uh, we, we optimize different parameters in order to get the highest conductivity possible. And uh, yeah, the, the concentration of the carriers is, is one thing, but, uh, but, but not least also the mobility and how they move between the chains, which is mm -hmm. usually the limiting factor. So optimizing the conditions like temperature, what type of oxidant, we use copolymers also to make a better microorganization uh, at, uh, of the polymers. It can largely improve the conductivity and uh, push a little bit the the negative permittivity into the visible. Okay, thank you.